So today we'll be talking more about careers in international development from a few of our senior level panelists who have had uh, amazing careers in both the State Department as well as USAID. Um, so today's panel features three special guests, Ambassador Frank Almaguer, who was ambassador to Honduras, along with serving in many senior level roles, including um, USAID, uh, in USAID, um, including a mission director to Ecuador. Um, ambassador Don Lee Beery, who served as ambassador to Burundi, as well as mission director in Nigeria and Uganda. And the Honorable Ann Arns, who served as career minister in the Foreign Service and held along with many other senior level roles in USAID, um, senior deputy assistant administrator for Asia. Um, and our moderator today, moderator today, um, Mr. Alonzo Fulgham, who was the former acting administrator to USAID. Um, and now I'll pass it along to Ambassador Ronald Newman, who will be giving some more remarks about the American Academy of Diplomacy and the work that we do here. Thanks very much, Carla. Uh, thank you for uh, deciding to do this panel. It was your project in the Academy. We're delighted to have some focus on the, on the development side. Just a, a brief commercial announcement about the Academy. Uh, the Academy has been around now for 36 years. It was formed by some pretty illustrious people like Henry Kissinger. Uh, George Kennan was charter member in the first meeting of the Academy. And it is still a small organization of senior people who have practiced diplomacy in various forms, mostly career, not all. And it really has two areas that it focuses on. One is talking to people about what diplomacy is and why it's important. That's the kind of thing we're doing here today. The other side is looking at things where we think diplomacy writ large can be improved. And that involves not only studies, but also active work with the Congress to get legislative change and work with the department, particularly Department of State, to push changes that we think um, are necessary. So that's the Academy is still, by the way, a small organization. We only take in about 20, 25 members a year. Uh, they have to be elected by the members and we don't elect everybody on the list to just keep this somewhat meaningful. And uh, so we're still only about 360 members, but I think you can, almost every uh, living Secretary of State has agreed to be an honorary member. And uh, the fact that we now have over a dozen members that have gone into this new administration, I think also speaks to the kind of people we have in the Academy, as do the people on this panel. And I'm really glad we are doing a panel on development. Uh, the development professionals have been our diplomatic partners in, all over the world, uh, sometimes working uh, in pure development uh, very often working hand in hand to try to make development and political goals work in tandem, or at least not come into conflict, which uh, can happen if you don't pay attention. And uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with two of the members of this panel. Uh, Don Liberi and I were in Iraq together uh, during some very interesting times. And uh, Alonzo Fulgham, before he went on to this uh, distinction of actually running the entire Agency for International Development uh, for, I think, over a year between uh, confirmed administrators, uh, was the aid director with me in Afghanistan. So I know we've got a top flight panel for you, and Alonzo is going to be the one to moderate it. So Alonzo, take her away. It's all yours. Ron, thank you very much. And uh, I got to be honest with you, we got 20 screens here that are, that are blank. I hope I'm not talking to empty rooms. Okay, come on, light up, young ladies. Come on, gentlemen, turn your screens on. We got a great group here today. You would have to pay to see these people in, in normal life. There we go, all you students. There you go, light them up. Come on, Nick, <laughs> there you go, Megan, Annalise, Joseph, Josh. Come on, Elijah, I know you're there. Come on, there you go. All right. Listen, um, you are in for a treat today. Uh, you have three of the most distinguished AIB colleagues that I've had a chance to work with, uh, making an appeal to you as students today to become a part of what I think is gonna be the most important part of our national security going forward. Mm -hmm. Really the diplomats make the policy, but it's the colleagues at AID and DFC and some of the other agencies that have to implement it. 
And today we're gonna to give you a chance uh, to, to ask some really good questions and get a sense of what it's like to have a career in the foreign service. What's gonna be interesting for you more than anything else because you guys like different and interesting things is that we have a couple of colleagues who didn't start off uh, in the diplomacy role, but they started out in AID and they ended up becoming ambassadors. Uh, and that's a stretch, that's a hard, hard thing to do. Uh, and you should, you'll should you get a chance to hear how they got there and why they did what they did, but also some of the steps they took along the way to take on those responsibilities. I say this to you as, as an important factor uh, because uh, we need you in the Foreign Service, we need you in the Civil Service, and this is an opportunity to get a lot of those questions asked as you start to develop your, your academic backgrounds going forth. I know most of you have already read the documents, uh, uh, at least their res resumes and CVs. Uh, so I'm not gonna have them go through a long deliberation about what they've done. I'm gonna go right to the questions and start asking questions of, to them that will get, that I think, that I think, excuse me, will be interesting for you. Uh, I'm gonna start with, um, with, uh, with Anne. Uh, Anne, uh, why don't you tell us, um, what did you What did you have to do to enter the agency? How did you get How did you get into the agency of international development? How did you get in? Well, uh, I came. I joined the USAID right out of college, actually, and I didn't join thinking it was going to be my career. I didn't. I didn't really know about international development. I just needed a job for a few years, and then I was going to go off and get my doctorate in political science and teach about American politics in university. And I got into USAID as an entry level job. I joined um, uh, as a civil service, a member of the civil service, not the foreign service. I joined as, as a civil service employee in the office of population. It was, uh, population was a pretty new field at that time in development. Um, and what the office did was to uh, design and carry out programs, uh, family planning programs in, in um, with developing countries all around the world. And um, so, so uh, I, what I learned was that the people in uh, the population field, people in my office were tremendously committed and um, they had you know, a real drive and a real sense of mission in carrying out those programs. So that's kind of what I absorbed when I was going through. Perfect. And I stayed, and I stayed in, yeah, I stayed in, uh, I stayed in as a civil service person for a long time until I joined foreign service and I loved it. Right. Well, um, first of all, I, I guess from, from early days, I had a strong interest in foreign affairs and in Latin America. I was born in Cuba, raised in Miami. Um, and when I majored in political science with an emphasis on international affairs at the University of Florida, <clears throat> I um, applied for the Peace Corps. Now this is uh, mid 60s and uh, this was an era in which both uh, Peace Corps and USAID were created in 1961. Uh, and um, I thought it was a perfect opportunity for me to better uh, scope out the international affairs uh, profession. And so I went to Belize. It was called British Honduras at the time. A uh, little side comment here that uh, when they first invited me to go uh, to join the Peace Corps, they invited me to go to Sri Lanka. Uh, I wrote back saying, hey, I'd be glad to do it, but I, I'm a native Spanish speaker. So they came back and said, oh yeah, so we'll send you to British Honduras. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as you can well imagine, the language spoken in, in Belize now, but British Honduras uh, is English. Uh, but I work in agricultural cooperatives, uh, putting some of my uh, newly learned skills in accounting and marketing, uh, helping cooperatives. Uh, by the way, it, one of the events that happened during my time in Belize was that I met a fellow, fellow Peace Corps volunteer at the time, and she and I will have been married 51 years. Uh, Congratulations. Later on. So it was uh, going to Belize was a rather meaningful uh, event. Uh, when I came back from the Peace Corps, I came to Washington and Peace Corps helped me, uh, placed me uh, through their contacts at the Office of Economic Opportunity. 
which was an agency created under Lyndon Johnson to manage their war, the war in poverty. And it was a beautiful place from which to start because all of a sudden I was seeing development from the domestic side. Uh, yeah. uh, and it was a great experience. Nevertheless, given my interest in, in foreign affairs, I did go through the process of both uh, the USAID's uh, foreign affairs or, or foreign service and the State Department foreign service. A bit of bad news for, for me at the time was that both agencies uh, were facing a rather big uh, retrenchment of staff coming primarily out of Vietnam. Right. Uh, they had to place so many people. So um, eventually having, having successfully met the requirements for both, uh, but I eventually received an invitation from USAID. And I, I came to USAID uh, at about as uh, low level as you can be, uh, an FS5 or six actually, uh, and working for an office that's far removed from the foreign affairs side, which is the Office of the Inspector General. Oh. <laughs> In those days, oh. it was called the Office of oh. the Auditor General. Uh, not exactly, but I figured, hey, you know, let's take a chance. Uh, it's a good opportunity, and I always have believed that if you if you do the right things, uh, you take an opportunity like this one, and you can make something out of it, and I did, and it was during that time that I, uh, I also got my master's. I continued to engage in, in discussions on the program side of USAID. And so I um, was with a, another detour in 1972, back to the Peace Corps in 74, back to the Peace Corps because AID underwent a furlough, a reduction in staff because of the nature of the, the number of people who were coming out of, of Southeast Asia. So I was detailed uh, to Peace Corps again, this time of staff. And so for the next five years, uh, I wound up on detail and uh, with Peace Corps. And it, it was a great opportunity uh, when I came back to AID in 1979, uh, I already had acquired a great deal of experience both in foreign affairs in development and in management. And so my career took off from that point. All right, hold that thought right there because I, I want the young people out there to understand that there's more ways to enter AID than just one. And Frank took the most secure, uh, non-securitist route to his uh, greatness. Yeah. Uh, Don, talk a little bit about uh, your, your experience in coming into USAID. Sure, well, mine started pretty early in the sense that when I was in high school, I managed to get on an internship program that essentially took me around the world. And um, as part of that, we were supposed to study a topic as a case study that we sort of took with us to the various countries that we went to. So I wound up studying, quote, population. And so it was an early introduction to public health, international affairs, et cetera. And um, we were able to also live with families. So from a very early stage, you know, I was still, as I said, in high school. In fact, I turned 17 on this trip. And um, it sort of opened to me this whole world of what international diplomacy was, development, et cetera. And I was able to carry that theme through college and then graduate school. And I was able to benefit from a lot of additional internships overseas. Um, when I got to graduate school, I was at Berkeley doing public health essentially. And part of the requirement was to do an internship. So I applied to the Office of International Health, which was part of HHS um, back in Washington. And it turns out that that internship was actually funded by USAID. And at that point, this program, the sort of young professional program known as the International Development Intern Program was still being sponsored by AID. And it's similar to the Foreign Service Program where you take an exam. The IDI program was one that essentially, you know, you had to apply for, compete for, get in, and then it sets you up on a Foreign Service career track. And so that's how I got into the agency and wound up being put immediately into the Foreign Service. And after some language development training in French and 
training in the sort of tools of development for USAID, project development and management, et cetera. We sort of went through at that time about a year's worth of training, a year and a half worth of training. And then we were sent overseas to our first post. And my first post was in Senegal. And, you know, I have to say, similar to, to Anne, I wasn't sure that USAID or the government was going to be my career for the rest of my life. Um, I, you know, I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to be in a bureaucracy. And so I said to myself, well, I'll give this three to five years. And as soon as it starts getting boring or too bureaucratic or whatever, I'll go work for whatever, an NGO, the World Bank, the UN, et cetera. And what wound up happening, and I think one of the beauties of the Foreign Service is that the learning curve is always up. Just as soon as you think you're, you know, you master wherever you are in whatever country you are and your programs, et cetera, and you sort of start, you know, tapping on the table thinking, hmm, this is great, but what else is there? Boom, you are assigned to another country. Often you have to learn another language. You have a whole new set of actors and policies and procedures to learn and understand. And then you start that process all over again. And so in my 35 years, it never once got boring. And I think that is one of the key things of the Foreign Service because you bring your skill set with you, but what you wind up doing is applying it to different situations. And I think that that's one of the beauties of the Foreign Service, particularly in development, because then you can see a sort of a longitudinal way of looking at programs and program development that I think serve you throughout your entire career. So that's just a bit of a snapshot. We'll come back to that. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to ask the question, and I think the young people out there are thinking, I may want to do this. But when did you know that you had the development bug? When did you know? When did you really know? Because this is not a job the Foreign Service is not a job on both sides, state or AID, where you go, I think I might want to do this. There's something that says, I really, really want. Well, when, when did you know you had the bug? And when did, uh, actually, Frank, you go first this time. When did you know you had the bug? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think in college, I took a number of courses in development economics, uh, the politics of the developing world. It was in vogue in, those, in that era. And I enjoyed it very much. And I really had this thirst to understand other countries and other cultures. And so to me, um, it, was, it was natural that I would gravitate in that direction. And um, early on, I knew that I wanted to work in, in public service. I, I just felt more comfortable in settings where I knew uh, that we were serving a, a greater good, if you will, and I certainly believed in, in the role of, of development in US foreign policy. And so I've never deviated from that. Uh, maybe I, I, I can get a little boring when it comes to a sort of career interest, but re the reality is that I was keenly interested in foreign policy and in international development, and I've remained interested to this day. And? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I said, I, I started in, I started as a civil service employee and I was just out of college and I got my, I instantly, I got my master's part-time. I decided master's degree was a useful thing to have. And so I did that part-time while I kept my full-time job. But I think that um, during those years, uh, when I was first in, just in Washington, I got a really, really strong sense of just how committed uh, people are to development. And just, and also um, the, the, uh, it's a real mission. They're just really driven. Uh, and, um, and of course I absorbed that too. And, um, and they, you know, you can, you can see how important development is at the individual level for the individual person and the families uh, in the developing countries who are, who benefit from it. You can see how important it is for the country the whole, their, their whole country, and you can see how important it is globally. And so it's extremely compelling. But what really, really sold me on staying there, because I kept thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to go off and, you know, just do whatever it was I was going to do. But really, what really I think sealed it for me was uh, after a few years, after I was old enough to be allowed to travel, um, I, uh, 
it was going to the countries and seeing the programs in the field and seeing it was so incredibly compelling to put those things together that I had learned from the Washington side. And in the, you know, looking at the family planning and health services, you can see just exactly how much that means to the woman in the field and how much that means to girls for their entire lives, that service. And it's, it was incredibly compelling. Uh, great, Don. Yeah, I mean, I would like to pick up on that point. For me, the key was seeing that the programs that we were doing on the ground, in the field, made a difference. I mean, every time you went to a village and you saw what, you know, oral rehydration programs were doing to save babies' lives, vaccination programs, um, when, you know, you saw contraception programs, uh, giving women a choice of when to have children. Um, all of these things were just so key. And you could see, uh, you know, villages that didn't have water before. Now, as a result of intervention, they had water. Some had electricity. All these things, you know, that we take for granted just made a huge difference in people's lives. And, you know, USAID, particularly in the health field, was, was and still is the largest international donor in the world. And so you had the resources to really make a palpable difference in people's lives. And once you really see that on the ground and you're able to go and you really develop a personal interaction with folks. You go to villages and you see families and you see individuals and you see how their lives change. You see girls go to school that hadn't gone to school before. Um, and, and this is palpable. And I think for me, that was the bug where it wasn't something that was in textbooks. It wasn't some theoretical construct of this is development, this is whatever. This was real life difference to people. And people would come up to you and say, thank you for all the programs that you're doing. It has just made an enormous difference in our family. And now my children will have a better life as a result of this program. And I, I, you know, there's no compensation for that. I mean, I think when you can see the fruits of, of labor um, palpably, that for me was, was all I needed to stay in. Okay, super. So we've learned two things so far that uh getting into the Agency for International Development is nonlinear, uh, that the people in the business have a strong passion for what they do and a love for, for other countries and the work that's going on there. The young people out there today are wondering, if I were to join A, tell me a little bit about the assignments. Who would I be working for? Um, and who would I be working with? And I think one of the things that's interesting in taking on a new job, you wanna find out it will the person I work for inspire me. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get a sense from you, one supervisor that you work with that inspired you and influenced your career, um, and then share that with the group a little bit. And I'll start with you this time, Don, because I've gone last on you the last three times. So you go first this time. Sure. Um, you know, when I first went out on my first assignment, um, and this is really interesting, I was not assigned to Senegal. But I had heard about Mike White, and Anne will probably remember Mike White. He was renowned as one of the, the best health, um, so he was a, a doctor. And he was known as just one of the best mentors and, and you know one of the best people in the agency in the field of health that you could uh, work with. And I said, you know, that some, sounds like someone I really want to get to know and, and be able to work with him. And so when the mission director came into town, David Shear, I made an appointment with him and I said, listen, I've heard about Mike White. I want to go work with him. And David said, that's great. We don't have a position for you, but I'll get back to you. And to make a long story short, I just kept pestering them. And um, finally, a position came open and I did go to Senegal. And it was worth it because Mike was the kind of person that um, had such empathy for everyone that he was involved with. And, you know, he was the kind of person that you could learn a lot from in terms of what it meant to be a field officer and what it meant to the people that you interacted with and that how values and empathy are so much more important than just the technical elements of the program. And that's someone who inspires you. 
I mean, this is someone who would go when no one else could get in to see the Minister of Health. Mike would just walk on over and the Minister of Health would open his door because he had such a great personal relationship that even when things became difficult, and things always do, there's always, you know, there are always some issues that, that become difficult between countries. If you establish those personal relationships, and that was the biggest thing that I learned from Mike, that in irrespective of what's going on diplomatically, if you have a great relationship with your counterparts, you can cut through the bureaucracy and, and really make things happen in spite of impediments. And so he was the person that inspired me. And every time we went out into the field, people just loved him. I mean, people just gravitated toward him because of who he was, what we were doing, and the way that we were implementing the programs that took into account the needs of people, not the needs of what, you know, we were trying to just do in terms of the technical elements. It was what was going to make a difference in their lives. So Mike really was a key person who influenced me. Frank, you want to pick up on that strand, please? Okay. Uh, two different names come to mind at two different points in my career. One, I mentioned that I had gone from Peace Corps to uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity. And the person who was running the health program for, for the OEO at that time was a gentleman by the name of Dan Zwick. And Dan Zwick gave me a taste for what a great public servant is all about. He worked tirelessly, constantly concerned about issues that would come up all over our country. Uh, and he engaged staff. He, he gave us a sense that we were making a difference in communities, both rural and urban. And I was totally green in the, in the, in the world of, of Washington. And yet within three weeks, I was out on my, fir my first field trip uh, out to, uh, to a place, I don't even remember the name, but it was right on the, uh, at the Southern tip of the uh, end of, the, of San Francisco Bay. Uh, a huge pocket of, of poverty in that area and trying to ensure that our health center there uh, was meeting the needs. And, and he quizzed and questioned and engaged in a way that gave me the motivation to say, hey, I, I, I'm adding some, something of value to this, to this effort. And that's great when you're, when again, at the bottom of the rung and, and somebody's actually showing you what it is to be committed. At a totally different level of time in my life, uh, a gentleman uh, who is a member of the Academy, uh, Peter McPherson. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, head of the Indian program at uh, USAID at the time when he became administrator. Actually, a, a little after he became administrator, I, 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 I uh, took over the Indian program and Peter was incessant engaged in every facet of the organization. And he really cared. And I, I, I had the good fortune of going with him on two separate occasions out to the field, one time to Ecuador and another time to Bolivia. And in both places, he wanted to know every detail of the program. And, and you can say, well, that's kind of micromanaging, but it, it, it was done in such a way that, that was not only strengthening the, the program, but also motivating staff. And I, I took a cue from that to say that it doesn't matter how high you are in, in an organization, and he was the senior ranking fellow at AID, that you can really engage with your staff in a very personal way, motivate you. And uh, overall, you know, the people who, who, who most impact all of us are the ones who have the, um, the, the emotional engagement in what they do. Uh, and one of the things that has always kept my interest in, in what I do and in the agencies in which I have worked is that emotional link to what we do. What we do is meaningful and it's proven over time. And there are people there who share in that passion. And those two gentlemen that I mentioned uh, served in that role. Well, now we've been inspired. We figured out how to get in the agency. We've got promoted. Uh, we've got people to inspire us. Now, we all know that the work we do at AID is not always easy. And it's very difficult. 
Um, and I wanted to hear uh, from both Ann and uh, Don in regards to being a woman in a male dominated field, how did you manage conflict uh, in, in, in your 32, 33 year careers? I think the women here would like to hear that. Mm -hmm. Manage conflict. Uh, management conflict in promotions, dealing with other uh, individuals that are managing you, not getting the assignments that you want, that, that kind of thing, that you thought you should, you should have deserved. Um, well, I'd like to say, first of all- Let me set it up a little bit better for you. Sorry, Ann. What we're trying to do is give these young ladies an, a sense of, they're hearing all these things about diversity, they're hearing about opportunities, whether or not they can move ahead. AID has always been known as a male dominated organization. You guys have done very well within that organization. And I wanted you to share some of your experiences, how you were able to manage around that. Does that help? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, do, do you want me to start? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I should say that um, fairly early while I was still in the civil service, I became a member of the Women's Action Organization. And that was an organization, a voluntary organization for women in the foreign affairs agencies, which at the time were USAID, the State Department, and the uh, US Information Agency, USIA. And um, it, it was very helpful because, uh, first of all, it was a great networking opportunity, and it helped me to um, taught me to do things that I never would have been able to do. I never would have had an opportunity to do at those lower grade levels, which was to figure out what issues we wanted to present, how to present them to people in leadership or people up the line, um, you know, and how to, how to do, to, how to prepare talking points and so forth. It was really good training and it was, it was a good training in how to present something without a lot of edges on it without emotional edges and, and to do it with a sense of confidence. So I think that was tremendously helpful. I will say that um, while um, I wouldn't say that opportunities were equal for, uh, for women in the Office of Population or, or elsewhere in the agency, I think they were actually slightly better in the population and health fields because those are fields that had a lot of, of, uh, have a lot of women in them. They were very slightly better, <laughs> very slightly, let me say. Um, I think that, uh, how did I do it? I think I, I learned how to um, have confidence in the position I was in. Uh, I, had a, I had a strong network of people that helped me, uh, there's no doubt about it, that helped me find out what jobs were available, what things were of interest and so forth and get the jobs. And then, um, and then uh, being in the jobs and especially being in management jobs, um, but not management as well. I, 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 uh, I learned the rules. I was very aware of what the rules were. I was very aware of what the pitfalls might be. Stay focused on what you wanna do. Stay focused on what you wanna get done. And um, you know, try to do it without anger. Uh, and just and just a clear head and keep your eye on what's your what your objective is. Um, I found after I uh, after I became got into the senior foreign service and particularly after I became the boss after I was a deputy mission director and a, and a mission director. Um, you know it, that's a that's a those are recognized positions and it wasn't uh, and it wasn't difficult. Um, but it was still. Uh, with people in other countries as well, in the other countries, uh, I think that there is a lot of respect for the position. And so if you've got the title, and in fact, in that sense, it's easier. If, you, if you're overseas and you've got the title, if you are the office director for something or other in the USAID mission, or if you are the deputy mission director or the mission director, they will respect that. And so in those senses, you're more neuter. Uh, but in, but in dealing with the American staff, it's really important to stand your ground and not be bullied. Mm -hmm. Just, that, that, that's, yeah. Yeah. There's, no, there's no formula for it, but I, I think that's the best bet. Uh, you wanna pick up on this, Graham? Sure. Alonzo, I'm sorry, say it again. 
Do you want to pick up on that? On that, yeah. On that brand? yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, and I'll echo a few things that Ann said. Um, one is you do have to develop a network. It's really important. And I know that you all hear that over and over again, but it is key because those folks will be your support. Um, the second thing is you do have to have good mentors. And, and this is where, you know, working with good bosses is very important. And so the, the and, and you, you know, one has to learn the organizational culture. And one piece of the organizational culture is that, you know, the, the, the corridor sort of, um, you know, network is as important and the corridor sort of reputation is as important. Um, and so you need to know, so who are some good people and mentors to work with? Uh, and you'll find that out fairly quickly. I think staying results oriented and trying to block out the noise is very important. Um, at the end of the day, USAID is a results oriented organization. Um, at the beginning of the rating year, you have certain goals that you're meant to achieve. At the end of it, you get evaluated on how well you help to achieve you individually as well as the organization. And you have a 360 sort of review process that, that says how well you did it, but also how well you worked with others. And I think this is another key part of it. Um, really um, develop the process of working with others in a teamwork fashion. You know, so there are times when- I'm gonna interrupt for a second. What happens if you're doing all those good things, doing all the right things, you got mentors, but you end up with a jerk for a boss? Who, well, who then, which has happened, which has happened. That's, what um, that's what they need to hear. They need to hear that part. They got the- Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I, then, then look, you know, adversity brings strength. So first of all, you have to learn how to work with all kinds of people. And even if you have a boss that's a jerk, you got to learn how to work with them. Okay. I mean, that's part of growing professionally. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and here's also something that I would say, again, keep your eye on the ball. I would say here, pick your battles. Not every issue is a battle that has to be fought you know, to death. And um, there are certain things that, yes, that if you again, feel- that, Say that again, say that again. Pick your battles because not everything, not every battle is a slight that has to be fought to the death, okay? So choose what it is you're going to fight over and say to yourself, is this worth fighting for my career? Now, if you feel that you have been, you know, discriminated against, if you have been, really forcibly forced out of uh, you know position or overlooked or whatever there are you know grievance processes that you can follow um but i think one of the first things to do is to actually um have the conversation not in a confrontational way but you know say listen what was it about my work that didn't, you know, measure up in your eyes, and then point out things that you did that, you know, to 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 counter that. Um, but you have to be very aware that every time you raise something, make sure you are on terra firma, um, because that's very very important to you as well as to everyone else that you know who's in that similar boat. And the other thing is really bosses who are total jerks, excuse me, they are known to everybody. Okay. So at a certain point, you are not the only person that has raised this because if they're that much of a jerk, other people have raised it. So know that you also have that network of people um, who can actually substantiate some of the, the issues that you're raising. Um, and stand your ground. I mean, if you feel that you are absolutely right about an issue, stand your ground. And it's really important, particularly as a woman, to do that. Um, because, you know, the who will blink, blink first is, is, you know, you, you really do have to stand your ground. Um, but again, I would say it's important not to make every single issue a battle because then that's all that you'll be doing for your career. And that, frankly, it's not the career that I wanted to have. I wanted to, you know, make sure that things that I was doing made a difference. 
um, but that I wasn't fighting the bureaucracy over and over again. And I don't think you have to. I mean, I think that there are enough opportunities out there. And if you prove your worth, you will get promoted. Thank you, that's Frank. Oh, yeah, let me add, uh, not only do I agree with all the comments that have been made, uh, I'm old enough to remember the first two or three women mission directors uh, who encounter their own challenges, including not being treated appropriately at, at, at the, the, the ranks above them. Um, at the same time, they all had that, that quality of knowing what, what they wanted to know, needed to know, uh, being totally assured uh, of their position and engaging in, 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 in the challenges of the job in a way that brought a lot of um, support for, for them. Uh, and they in turn created an environment where having women move up the ranks became a more normal uh, situation. I was also in one of my multiple jobs uh, and probably the one that I disliked the most was being head of personnel for USAID and the thankless job. A thankless no. job, totally thankless. No. Uh, but there encountered a number of situations where it was absolutely necessary to counsel uh, supervisors uh, for their treatment or mistreatment of not only women, but also minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are challenges, you know, one that comes to mind, I remember in, in 1986 thereabouts, I was U.S. Mission Director in, uh, in Ecuador. And uh, we welcomed a new staff member. Uh, she was, this was her first assignment. And within days, she was uh, picked up by the local police uh, and literally had to use her, her nickel or, or whatever the, the phone was at that time. It wasn't a cell phone. Yeah. It wasn't a cell phone, that's right, mm -hmm. to uh, get a hold of me. Uh, a woman, a young woman, and she happened to be black. And she tells the police in her broken Spanish that she actually is an, a U.S. Foreign Service officer working for USAID. And they just couldn't, couldn't accept that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's the kind of challenge that most of us don't face. Right. Uh, and so getting them to understand uh, that we're all equal uh, and that you have to treat all Americans uh, as we expect. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, just, just in the last uh, few days, uh, my successor as US, mission, uh, U.S. Ambassador in Honduras was a gentleman by the name of, uh, of Larry Palmer. And Larry Palmer just passed away uh, this week, a uh, very sad occurrence. Um, but when I left uh, Honduras as ambassador, I kept reading the local newspapers and they couldn't get beyond the fact that this new American ambassador was black. Um, I am told, I don't know whether this is true or not, but we have a, a gentleman that all of us in the Foreign Service whose name we know, Otto Reich. Uh, Otto Reich was a political uh, appointee, but Otto Reich was nominated to be U.S. Ambassador in Venezuela during the Reagan administration. And Otto Reich, despite the name, was born in Cuba. And allegedly the Venezuelan ambassador or the foreign minister uh, went to George Shultz, the then Secretary of State, and said, you know, look, we appreciate it, but we were like a real American. And uh, the story is told that George Schultz uh, showed him the door uh, after saying a few uh, appropriate words uh, to the gentleman who was complaining about the fact that this individual was not a real American. So whether, whether black or Asian or Hispanic or woman or man, you are an American representative, each one of them has a unique set of challenges. Uh, I've experienced them, I've seen them, uh, but we deal with them uh, in ways that, that both uh, uh, Anne and, and Dawn have, have noted that you, 
and, and, you, and you have to prove that you know as much as anybody else, which is unfortunate because you shouldn't have to be proving it all the time, but it's, but it's true. Uh, but times have changed, fortunately, and I think we're seeing a, a, a total different environment. And in my whole entire career, I have never seen the kind of emphasis uh, that this administration and that the Secretary of State is placing on ensuring that the U.S. Foreign Service reflects America in all of its ways. And, and the impact, I think, is going to be tremendous. Look, I really wish we had a, a bunch of more time, but I've been told by my taskmaster, uh, Ben, I <laughs> to ask questions now. So uh, I had a couple more questions for you, but let's get the students in because they're the ones we're trying to impress here. So let's hear from them. Right. Who's going to be the Springbok? Who's up first? Come on. <laughs> I'm... Tyler, why don't you call on someone? That, just put them on the spot. <laughs> sure thing. Um, Isabella Hopkins, I know you had a great question that you submitted to the Google form if you wanted to ask it. Hi. Um, I was wondering how the legal industry came into play with international development careers. I was wondering if you could go into that because I'm considering law school and I was just wondering um, if any of you were in that field either. Any of the panelists can answer that, Don, Frank, or Andrew can answer that. Uh, both State Department and, uh, and AID uh, have strong legal offices and Foreign Service mm -hmm. officers who are lawyers by, by academic training uh, and practicing. Uh, and in some cases, they may be doing other things uh, because it's typical, kind of in response to a question that I saw, uh, what what uh, kind of uh, academic or professional preparation you need, and the answer really is bring a strong desire to learn. Uh, because I have seen lawyers do great things, and I have seen uh, others who have uh, other kinds of degrees that may seem unrelated to to what we do, do a tremendous job as well. Uh, you just have to be part of, uh, understand and, and engage and learn every day. Yeah. Next question. And did you want to add anything or Don, you want anything? Or do you think, I think it's good. Next, next question, please, Tyler. No, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just, I'd, I'd just like to add uh, my own observation of the, of the lawyers in USAID that over the years that I've known. And, um, Quite a number of them, if they're interested in it, uh, in the Foreign Service, quite a number of them do move on and become, go into the management of USA programs at the, at the Deputy Mission Director and Mission Director level and um, have been very successful. And they, because they come with the, uh, with the ability to absorb lots of information and the thoughtfulness and the experience in looking at, at a lot of issues. Um, a great analytical ability to be very successful. Yeah. I have a question. Um, this is, this might be based on experience. It's a bit more of a subjective question, but my aunt worked or works in international development. And from the age of basically 25 to 40, she was traveling the world um, like at least I mean, every few months she was probably going to a different country. Um, and so she never really settled down until later in life. And so I was wondering how your careers affected your, did that affect like your family life or your relationship with other people? Did you feel like you kind of um, had a later start to like a fam the familial aspect of life? Um. Well, I can start with that since I have actually remained um, single. And so to a certain extent, I think that did impact some of my, you know, personal choices. Um, I think that might be a bit different now in terms of having tandem careers, although, you know, Anne should speak to that and, and Frank. Um, and sometimes it can be tough. I mean, you know, again, as a professional woman, you have to make some choices. And it's not always easy to, you know, find um, a partner who, you know, 
wants to put their career on, um, you know, not, not a back burner, but who's willing to travel around the world um, and, you know, or, you know, want to switch off. And I think it, having a tandem couple career is, is, you know, has its other set of challenges, which I think Anne can respond to. Um, I, but I have found that for me personally, um, I think it, it, you know, it, I, I have, you know, remained single. I wouldn't say it's just because I was in the foreign service, but moving from country to country and place to place over the years does put a strain on relationships. And, um, and you know, you know, sometimes you just have to accept that and um, doesn't mean you don't have relationships. It just means that you may not have relationships in the normal course of events. Yeah, uh, so um, uh, fortunately for, for me, um, it, I mean, it wasn't accidental, but um, it worked out well. Fortunately, um, I married a, a person that also worked for USAID. And we met in a meeting, and so that's the, you know, that's a, um, a good reason to go to meetings, I think, in case you, know, you don't want to, but you never know what's going to happen. Um, but uh, I think that, um, it, and we were both civil service at the time, and we had both uh, considered going overseas many, many times and had had some chances to both of us separately to uh, convert to the foreign service. And we didn't go until after we had our children, but we went, but we took them overseas when uh, we were, they were ages three and five. And um, so you don't, you don't have to postpone it. <laughs> It's it's true there are there are issues. Uh, there's good news and bad news about being a tandem couple because you do have to find uh, assignments where you're hopefully in the same country in the same the same AID mission, and you can find two jobs that are reasonably professionally um, appropriate and challenging uh, for both of you. And so that's it's it's a challenge, but I think USAID does uh, the best it can. It, I mean it's it's very helpful because. Uh, it's good to have tandem couples also. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I think uh, we had a, a wonderful time uh, and our children uh, learned a lot, uh, learned a lot living overseas. I found it uh, actually in many ways as a working mother, I found it to be um, slightly easier than it was working in DC at the time because uh, for one thing, childcare was much easier to find in Pakistan, which is the first place we went. And it was much easier to find good health, good childcare, excuse me, good childcare and um, was much less expensive. But uh, so that so that really relieves a major stress of a working mother. And um, and I found that the atmosphere at posts was, at least in the USAID post, it's generally speaking, very welcoming of newcomers and very welcoming to families as well. They want people to feel comfortable and, and have things to do with the kinds of things they enjoy. Um, so I think, you know, as far as the children went, uh, our children, um, we thought we were very, my husband and I were very pleased with it uh, because they did, you know, they, they came out to be very flexible. You have to be flexible. You have to realize that things change and sometimes they change in a hurry. And sometimes, in fact, they were both evacuated with my husband from Pakistan when we were there in the beginning of the first Gulf War. And that's, a, you know, there are things that change abruptly and you just deal with reality. Um, but they're very flexible. They're, they have a lot of empathy. They realize the United States is not the center of the world and that there are other cultures and there are plenty of other perspectives and ways of looking at things. And you can never assume everybody thinks the same way you do. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, what we were happiest about was that they're both very happy that they grew up overseas. And, and I would like to say, actually, from myself, that those years that we were overseas with our family, I would say, um, were the, uh, the hardest <laughs> and the most intense and the happiest years of my life. They were, they were really wonderful. So I... I think people make different choices about what they're going to do, but in terms of um, in terms of getting married and have a family, having a family and so forth, it, it's possible. It's challenging, and that's kind of part of the fun of it. 
one last question. Mm -hmm. Maybe Frank, did you want to add anything there, or you want to? Go I just ahead? wanted to add that uh, every generation has has uh, certain realities with regards to the family and family life in the foreign service. Uh, uh, these days, uh, so many posts are uh, unaccompanied posts, uh, where the family remains behind. Uh, that that's always a very painful and challenging uh, issue. I. In, in my case, I, I didn't have to deal with that with, with our kids uh, who grow up mainly overseas, but I wish we had had Zoom or other of these uh, <laughs> current uh, assets because uh, being a, a doting grandfather, I kind of feel sorry now that my kids, my, my children, did not get to experience uh, their grandkids, grandparents the way that I'm experiencing the role as of a grandparent uh, because of the distance, because of the lack of communication over time. But, but right now, again, the challenges are, are immense. Um, uh, and, and so it is one of the areas where a prospective uh, foreign service officer should consider uh, as they contemplate a career in, in the service. Mm -hmm. yes. And yeah. along just to add to that, because I think Frank raises a good point. And I think to be realistic now, going into the Foreign Service, um, you should anticipate at different points in your career that you will have unaccompanied assignments. I mean, if you go as a family, if you, um, you know, will get married along the way and have children along the way. I have to say, as mission director in both Iraq and Afghanistan, well, I was, I was mission director in Iraq and managing the civilian program in Afghanistan. And one of the key issues was always the unaccompanied element of the postings, because people being separated from their families um, is very, very, you know, it, it's very difficult. And it's not just in, you know, war-torn places. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we had the same thing because of security and other issues. In Burundi, I had to evacuate the embassy twice. And so twice I had to deal with, you know, the whole notion of unaccompanied families and, um, you know, foreign service officers who were unaccompanied. And I think you need to anticipate that as part of today's reality. Um, so just put that in mind. It's not, you know, it's not, there's nothing um, inherently bad about it. It's just, a, it's just a challenge that you'll have to deal with at some point. Yeah. Uh, Destiny, you get the final question. So I was just going to ask if there's anything you wish you would have known before you started in international development that you would like to share with the attendees. Hmm. Someone, someone mentioned or repeated the word, I think it was Dawn, uh, networking. Um, I, I think that over the many years in which I have been in uh, active uh, professional life, uh, nothing is as important uh, in, in your career as having a good network of individuals who can not so much help you in getting this other job, but counsel, be, be mentors, be role models for, for for what you want to be and who are able to show you uh, what, what, what the work life that we're engaged in is, is all about. Uh, mm -hmm. So in your college years, I wish I, wish I had done more, uh, more uh, interacting with my professors uh, and would have had a, I think a more satisfying experience uh, and of something I learned later on that you really have to get to know people uh, as people in, in any setting. Don, you want to add anything? Don, Ann, you want to add anything? Um, okay, sure. Uh, well, I, uh, I wish I'd known, <laughs> I wish I'd known when I started out, I wish I'd known exactly what the agency was. Um, all kinds of things that you can now find out on the, on the net uh, before you start a job and you, you know, should, should go in more prepared. But um, I, I agree absolutely uh, with Frank that the networking is something I didn't know anything about for the first like two or three years, three maybe that I was there. And it made it, uh, I learned so much from it and it was uh, professionally so helpful to me 
And as Don said, you know, all the way through my career, I had my network of people that I knew in USAID, which was, of course, enormously helpful in finding out what the agency was doing and finding out what resources were and also finding out what, what uh, jobs were coming up because, you know, men have, um, they always talk about men getting together and, uh, you know, smoking your cigars or whatever they do. But <laughs> women have a network too, uh, and you can develop it. Um, I, I, you know, I wish that, uh, I wish that um, I had known sooner. I guess that's one of my main <laughs> things. I wish I had known sooner how much, how wonderful it was and actually tried how wonderful it was to be overseas because it, it, you know, it made all the difference and to have that experience. I really loved it. And, um, and then finally, it, it, this I didn't really learn this one for a long time that even though, uh, you know, if I worked hard, I could do a pretty good job and you know, at most jobs I could do pretty well. Um, but if I wanted to do really, really well, I needed to be in a job that I love and a job that was, that was interesting and exciting. Uh, so um, that's, I think, um, that's the argument for always paying attention to find, looking for something that you find really, really interesting and consuming. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things uh, to what my colleagues have said. Um, I think I wish I had known earlier on more about the culture of the agency and the culture of the agency also vis-a-vis -vis the culture of the interagency. Now I think new officers going in have to know not just AID, but they've got to know the State Department, the Defense Department, the whole interagency, how that works. And I have to tell you something, each agency has its own, you know, each organization has its own culture. And um, knowing that what that culture is, knowing what your own culture is and navigating that as quickly as possible is very important. But now more than ever, AID has to fit into an interagency culture within the US government, within the whole US you know, apparatus overseas. And, you know, as ambassador in, in Burundi and, um, and, you know, working in settings like Afghanistan and Iraq, where you're there working alongside State Department, Defense Department, et cetera, and where the Defense Department is the 800 pound gorilla in the room, it's, you know, it's, it's very important to know from the get go what different agency cultures are, how you bring your culture to the table, how that interacts with the rest of the interagency, and the importance of that, because those things are not things that you're taught, it's things that you have to pick up. But I would say picking those up quickly is gonna be very important. And I think the one other thing that I have learned is that sometimes the best, sometimes the worst is the best. Sometimes you think, oh, this assignment, I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it or this or that. And, and, and you, know, you think, oh, it's a hardship assignment. It's, uh, you know, why am I getting this assignment? And often, if you're open, those turn out to be the best assignments that you have because there's a certain level that you have to deal with that I think um, can help to bring out the best in who you are professionally because they are difficult assignments. So don't consider that tough assignments are a punishment. Often look for the silver lining because what I have found in my career is that often those turned out to be my best assignments. So. Absolutely. Ron, I'm gonna throw it back to you. I think we're, Kyla, are we out of time? Yes, we are. <laughs> Kyla, okay, Ron, I'm gonna throw it to you to close it out. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I just, first of all, I wanna thank the panel. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Alonzo who, uh, I thought did a fascinating and stimulating job. I hope that many of you who are, you know, really focused down on planning your careers, carried away a couple of points from this discussion. One is how little planning matters, that there's a lot of happenstance in life and you jump in and you do it. Uh, don't worry about the plan because the plan will probably go to hell anyway. Um, yeah. And, and so it's, it's worth thinking about that. And, you know, there was a point that was made early on. You have to enjoy what you do. And if this is what you enjoy, um, it's a great way, you know, if development and moving around are things you like, you know, this is a gypsy existence with an institutional paycheck. Um, 
that's a hard mix to beat uh, if you enjoy the work. So I hope the people who've been listening to it uh, will think about this as a career, uh, but do a gut check. It has to be the one you want. And to Frank and Don and Anne uh, and Alonzo, thank you so much. And for Kyla, thank you for thinking of it. Thank you for designing it. And thank you for deciding this is what you wanted to do. Great job, Kyla. Great job. Thank you. And that's pretty cool. And one last word, we need you. So please be passionate, but join us because this is a great career and the Foreign Service does need you. Right. Great closing, Don. Appreciate you guys. All right. Take care. Be well, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.